Good day and welcome to the SAP Q2 2020 Earnings Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Stefan Gruber, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Hey, good morning or good afternoon. This is Stefan Gruber. Thank you for joining us to discuss our results for the second quarter 2020. I'm joined by our CEO, Christian Klein, and our CFO, Luka Mucic, who will both make opening remarks on the call today. Also joining us for Q&A is Executive Board Member Adair Fox Martin, who leads our customer success organization, and Ryan Smith, founder and CEO of Qualtrics. Before we get started, as usual, I would like to say a few words about forward-looking statements and our use of non-IFRS financial measures. Any statements made during this call that are not historical facts are forward-looking statements, as defined in the U.S. Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Words such as anticipate, believe, estimate, expect, forecast, intend, may, plan, project, predict, should, outlook, and will, and similar expressions as they relate to SAP are intended to identify such forward-looking statements. SAP undertakes no obligation to publicly update or revise any forward-looking statements. All forward-looking statements are subject to various risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from expectations. The factors that could affect SAP's future financial results are discussed more fully in SAP's filings of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, including SAP's annual report on Form 20F for 2019, filed with the SEC on February 27, 2020. Participants of this call are cautioned not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements, which speak only as of their dates. On our Investor Relations website, you can find our half-year report, our quality statement, and a financial summary slide deck, which are intended to supplement our prepared remarks today and include a reconciliation for our non-IFS numbers to IFS numbers. Unless otherwise noted, all financial numbers referred to on this conference call are non-IFS and growth rates and percentage point changes are non-IFS as reported year over year. The non-IFS financial measures we provide should not be considered as a substitute for or superior to the measures of financial performance prepared in accordance with IFRS. And finally, as you've seen in our quarterly statement, we plan to hold a virtual Capital Markets Day in the fourth quarter later this year, where we plan to provide an update on our midterm strategy. More information will be provided in due time. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our CEO, Christian Klein. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. And welcome, everyone, to our Q2 earnings call. I hope that you, your families, and friends are safe and manage to keep your spirits up in these challenging times. This is our second quarterly earnings call during the pandemic. But our first full quarter under the COVID impact. And given the situation, it was a fantastic one. Of course, the crisis is far from over, but still our results reflect the progress we have made as a company since the pandemic hit hard in March. We have adapted to the situation by truly transforming into a virtual organization and allowing our customers to continue with their business. 17,000 customer go lives in the past six months alone are showing SAP's resilience in this crisis. Also, go lives in the cloud are happening now in weeks rather than months. This shows how SAP enables our customers to react with agility and speed in this crisis. As we have said before, SAP is crucial to the business transformation of our customers, and we are working to emerge stronger out of the crisis. If customers are in a difficult spot financially right now, we will provide commercial relief where needed because we want to build partnerships for life. Inside SAP, we continue to selectively hire into our future growth opportunities, striking a balance between near-term profit and innovation. But we also have an obligation towards society. Our purpose is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. And I'm proud that ever since the crisis broke, we have been supporting the public with projects, financial assistance, donations, and technology around the world. Let's move to the quarter now. Luca will take us through the numbers in a minute, but let me say, these results show yet again how well our intelligent enterprise strategy is resonating with customers. They completely understand Digitalization is no longer an option, but a must to achieve desired business outcomes, 
resiliency, profitability, and sustainability. And the results prove as well our own progress in that regard. In June, we completed our first ever virtual Sapphire Now, a milestone event with 130,000 participants and close to 600,000 session views in the first week alone. And during the crisis, digitalization and remote delivery ensured customer service continued without disruption. We have added over 500 S4HANA customers in Q2, close to 40% of them net new. And we have seen a lot of competitive wins, such as Carrefour, which also subscribed to a set of cloud solutions, including Aripa. Other S4HANA wins included Telefonica, Aeon, BNP Paribas, Neptune Energy, Vedanta, Comics, and Deutsche Börse, taking the total S4HANA customer count now to more than 14,600. We have also seen more than 700 customers go live on S4HANA in Q2, including Colgate, Zalando, and Beeline. And you have probably seen that IDC just ranked S4HANA as leader in cloud ERP enterprise applications. Looking at sales performance in the second quarter, it is no surprise. We saw a huge demand for the solutions that increase resiliency while offering rapid return. Our portfolio is extremely relevant in the crisis. Commerce obviously had an absolute blowout quarter, as did digital supply chain management, led by our cloud night native IPP solution, which matches rapidly changing demand to supply. Moderna, a U.S. biotechnology company pioneering a vaccine a candidate against COVID-19, just selected SAP to help with the distribution of the potential vaccine. We also saw a very significant number of IBP go live, such as Verizon and Renault Brazil, and of course continue to be ranked number one in supply chain management by IDC and Gartner. In addition, our business technology platform showed excellent performance as customers use it to quickly integrate and flexibly extend solutions. Gartner has just ranked us leader in their magic quadrant on multi-experience development platform, and major Q2 deals included L'Oreal and the Australian Department of Defense. Out-of-the-box integration for our SaaS applications remains key for us. We are making excellent progress in delivering a seamless business process integration, including key elements like harmonization of SAP's data domain model, user experience, workflow management, and real-time steering. We are at 50% done with integration, targeting 90% by year-end. Success factors had a good quarter, including an important competitive replacement and a major competitive win with Bosch Group. At more than 8,000 customers, success factors continue to lead the global HCM market by a wide margin. They are also about to reach their 100 times 100K milestone. 100 global customers using success factors to manage more than 100,000 employees each. And we are very happy to report Google has gone live on Ariba. And finally, Qualtrics had yet another fantastic quarter with strong growth and is helping us to differentiate our core applications by adding experience management. Especially the combination with success factors, the human experience management suite resonates really well with our customers. By now, I'm confident you have all seen the news. Please allow me a couple of remarks before moving beyond Q2. Wine and I are convinced that a proposed partial IPO marks a win-win situation and creates the best setup for Qualtrics to fully test the potential of a fast-growing experience management market. Under the leadership of Wine and his outstanding team, Qualtrics will enjoy greater autonomy in expanding and leveraging its footprint both within SAP's customer base and beyond. We will remain Qualtrics' majority shareholder. We will also remain its largest and most important go-to-market and R&D partner while giving Qualtrics the independence to broaden its base by partnering and building out the entire experience management ecosystem. Against this background, I want to emphasize that Qualtrics is 
and continues to be a key element of our intelligent enterprise strategy. Moving beyond Q2, let me revisit a few key elements of our strategy. Number one, a clear focus in our existing markets. Doubling down on categories where SAP has a why to win. Differentiating via the broadest and deepest suite, end-to-end -end integration, real-time analytics, fully enabled artificial intelligence with concrete outcomes for our customers, a harmonized user experience, and very importantly, our leadership in experience management. Our PLM and intelligent asset management partnership with Siemens is a prime example for this new focus. Two market leaders coming together to take over the lead in industry 4.0. Number two, Accelerate growth by expanding into new markets. Let me just give you two examples. The industry cloud. All industries are transforming, and every new business model requires data and a strong integration into the backbone, which in many cases is in its SAP's core applications. This is our way to win. We will build modular industry apps, helping our customers to stay competitive in their industry by adapting to new business models with a fast time to value. We are co-innovating on our platform with our partners and customers, the biggest brands in the world. This is a 170 billion euro market. Already this quarter, we closed a significant deal with a large utilities provider. Also, we will doubling down on building the world's largest business network. The crisis shows more than ever the world is becoming increasingly complex, and companies need to react faster and more agile to changing market conditions. This is why we will change the way enterprises run by connecting customers, manufacturers, suppliers, and logistic providers in one network where they can manage cross dependencies in real time, creating win-win situations for all stakeholders in the network. Number three, sustainability and climate 21. We are expanding our solutions to allow customers to measure and reduce carbon emissions along their value chain. Since earlier this year, we are running trials with customers from industries like auto, chemicals, food, and engineering. With this, SAP takes another important step in turning our customers into sustainable intelligent enterprises, ultimately proving that intelligent enterprises can make sustainability profitable and profitability sustainable. And finally, number four, provide additional options to move to the cloud. Customers want to move to the cloud at their own pace and scope based on their individual situation. We will respond by expanding the options to move, accelerating the cloud migration. Later this year, we will launch a tightly integrated pre-configured public cloud suite expanding beyond ERP and we will introduce a new private cloud offering for customers that require high levels of differentiation with an easy to consume <coughs> commercial model. For all our cloud offerings, we will continue to leverage hyperscalers and system integrators to manage most of the cloud ERP infrastructure workloads. Let me now turn to our financial prospects. Luca will talk about the 2020 outlook in a minute. Let me briefly comment on the midterm perspective. Our 2023 ambition remains unchanged from what we announced in Q1 because it continues to reflect our view as of today. That said, we are in the process of updating our strategy. We are refocusing the company, identifying growth areas, evaluating additional business opportunities. We will be ready to give you an, up an update at the capital markets day towards the end of the year. We hope and expect that our assessment of the implications of COVID-19 on our midterm ambition will also be clearer then than it would be today. Now, I know some of you are concerned about SAP might neglect its efficiency focus as part of the process. Let me assure you, we will continue to relentlessly execute the best one program as laid out at our Capital Markets Day last November. Execution is in full swing. We move from a complex metrics organization to a lean functional setup with clear responsibilities. We have removed overlaps and overheads, making it easier to work with 
and within SAP. We are streamlining our portfolio, focusing on areas of strength. You have, you have seen the divestiture of digital interconnect in Q2. We are putting customer success first everywhere, including compensation. We are consolidating our event schedule and will continue to build out our digital marketing capabilities. We have continued to work on our cloud delivery efficiency, bringing the cloud cross margin up by seven percentage points over the last 18 months. And if you look at Q2, our operating margin is up almost two percentage points, despite the heavy toll on top line the crisis has taken. But let me make one thing clear. We will continue to manage this company for value, not short-term margin maximization. If we believe a strategic move is right, if we think it makes sense to accelerate the cloud migration of our customer base, if we see an opportunity to grow where we have a right to win, we will investigate and not pass by default, just because revenue mix shift might have an adverse impact on operating margin and in the short run. And with that, over to you, Luca. Yeah, thanks a lot, Christian. Um, I'm really proud that our team successfully navigated the very challenging environment to deliver a better than anticipated quarter. We were happy to see a strong sequential improvement in software licenses revenue, robust margin expansion, and a strong free cash flow development. In Q2, our current cloud backlog showed a strong growth of 20%, reaching 6.7 billion euros with continued high demand for digital supply chain, e-commerce, cloud platform, and Qualtrics solutions. Cloud revenue was up 19%, reflecting the strength of our contractually committed cloud business, which was partially countered by lower pay-as-you-go transactional revenue due to the COVID-19 crisis. This cloud revenue growth, together with our consistent software support revenue stream, demonstrates the resilience of our business model. Our more predictable revenue expanded by approximately five percentage points, reaching 73% in the second quarter. In Q2, our cloud and software revenue grew by 3%. For the first six months, our cloud and software revenue was up 5% or 4% of constant currencies, a very strong showing given the impact of COVID-19. Before moving to the bottom line, let me briefly give you some color on our regional software results. Software licenses revenue, while still below normal levels, recovered more than expected. In particular, the APJ region had a stellar performance, backed by a very strong recovery driven by Japan, South Korea, and Indonesia. In the Americas, we saw a modest recovery, primarily from a strong sequential improvement in the United States. Now moving on to the bottom line. Our overall cloud gross margin grew by two percentage points to almost 70%. All cloud business models contributed to this margin expansion. Our SaaS pass margin grew by one percentage point, our intelligent spend margin grew by two percentage points, and our infrastructure as a service margin grew even by 14 percentage points. In Q2, our cloud and software gross margin was impacted by the decline in software licenses revenue and the mixed shift effect from our cloud business. Still, our software license and support gross margin was up by 30 basis points, and our cloud and software gross margin only decreased by 20 basis points to 81%. Our services gross margin increased by two percentage points and reached 26%. This is mainly the result of further efficiency gains in our consulting and premium engagement business. Despite the slower top-line growth, our operating profit grew strongly by 8% to almost 2 billion euros. Our operating margin expanded by 1.8 percentage points to 29.1%. At the beginning of the crisis, we were quick to initiate prudent measures such as the slowing of hiring and a reduction in discretionary spending to ensure our financial flexibility. Our results speak for themselves, showing that those swift actions have paid off in Q2. We are also benefiting from natural savings, like lower travel expenses, lower facility-related costs, and virtual rather than physical events. Now let me turn to IFRS operating profit, EPS, and taxes. In Q2, IFRS operating profit increased by 55% to 1.3 billion euros, 
benefiting from lower restructuring expenses. For the same reasons, our IFRS earnings per share increased by 54%. Non-IFRS EPS increased by 7%. We also updated our effective tax rate guidance for the full year. We now expect these tax rates to be between 28.5 to 29.5% for IFRS and 27.5 to 28.5% for non-IFRS. The increase in comparison to the previous outlook mainly results from a tax ruling in Q2, where the German Federal Fiscal Court partly confirmed SAP's opinion in its final decision. While that decision leads to a significant reduction of contingent liabilities for the whole case, the part of the ruling that was decided against SAP leads to additional income tax expenses and in financial income to related interest expenses thereon. The cash flow, however, will show a positive impact in a future quarter when SAP is partially reimbursed for previously made tax payments. This is also a good segue into talking about our cash flow results. In the first six months, our operating cash flow was strong and improved by 41% to 3.8 billion euros. This was supported by positive effects from lower restructuring related payments and lower income tax payments as expected. Our free cash flow was up even further and grew by 59% to 3.1 billion euros. Free cash flow additionally benefited from lower CapEx spend compared to the previous year. Now to our financial guidance. We are reconfirming our 2020 revenue and profit outlook matrix as detailed in the quarterly statement published earlier today. In addition, we increased our cash flow guidance for the full year 2020. Based on the strong performance that we have seen in the first half year, we now expect an operating cash flow of above 5 billion euros and a free cash flow of approximately 4 billion euros. Before closing, I wanted to talk about some of our social and environmental highlights and update you on a few of our key non-financial matrix. Christian spoke already about how we are fulfilling our role of an enabler of positive impact from human experience software to Climate 21. I would now like to talk about our role as an exemplar. In Q2, our employee retention increased to 93.9%, up 60 basis points since last quarter. We made further progress, increasing the share of women in management by 1.1 percentage points to 27.3%. Driven by a strong decrease in travel due to the COVID-19 crisis, our carbon emissions were 25 kilotons, a decrease of 50 kilotons. For 2020, we have adjusted our greenhouse gas emissions target from 238 to 210 kilotons. And finally, last year we announced the creation of the Value Balancing Alliance. This alliance aims to create a global standard for the disclosure of positive and negative impacts of corporate activity across the complete value chain. After having worked intensively on the first version of the methodology over the last nine months, the piloting phase has now started across all participating companies. We are excited to be at the forefront. To summarize, our broad solution portfolio, our unmatched industry and geographic diversification, coupled with our strong base of more predictable revenue, have allowed us to weather the COVID-19 crisis this quarter. Our quick response to the crisis on the cost side drove strong operating profit and margin expansion. With disciplined investments in strategic growth areas, we are confident we will not only weather the crisis, but can emerge from it even stronger. I'm proud of all of our employees who have shown remarkable resilience as they continue to collaborate by virtual means and operate effectively through this challenging environment. Thank you very much, and we will now be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. We can start the Q&A session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you wish to ask a question at this time, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please make sure your mute function is switched off to allow your signal to reach your equipment. And that's again star 1 to ask a question. And we take our first question from Charlie Brennan from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Thanks very much for taking my question and uh, congratulations on a good quarter. Um, can I just start with a question for you, Christian? Uh, I think a lot of the focus today is going to be around your comments around uh, updating the, the medium-term targets. Um, when you're thinking about investing in the business, can you tell us whether those investments um, include M&A or, or do you just think about 
organic investments. And then no doubt the market's going to be speculating between the, the growth and the margin trade-off. Will you only take margins lower if you think you can accelerate top-line growth? Or can you see a scenario where margins need to be lower to support the existing top-line growth ambitions? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, on the growth side of the house, first of all, you, know, you heard me talking about the new growth opportunities of SAP like Industry Cloud. And these growth initiatives are not taking out of the blue. I mean, these are categories which are on the one hand side showing big growth, but also clearly where SAP has a way to win with organically built cloud solutions. Yeah, as a lot of the data and processes you need to verticalize your industry specific processes are sitting actually in the core of SAP. On top, as you also have seen, our ambition is not to build the industry cloud only by our own. We formed now major partnerships with Siemens you know, on the PLM side to scale Industry 4.0, providing even more value to our customers. We have closed the partnership with Honeywell to also make the real estate industry an intelligent enterprise. And of course, on top, we are constantly screening the market you know, for potential tuck-in acquisitions, but only if it really makes sense you know, to fill white spots in our portfolio, which are also close to the core of SAP. On the margin side, I mean, clearly what we see now in this crisis, there is a huge acceleration you know, with the move to the cloud. I mean, commerce, supply chain, we are delivering the solutions you know, even more to the cloud. When I talk to CEOs these days, they're actually afraid of the resilience of running their own data center. So this is why I also talked about launching a new business model, because I believe a business transformation is not only happening by moving your workloads to a cloud infrastructure. A business transformation is happening with the help of SAP, with intelligent applications, with partners of the ecosystem helping to transform your business processes. And this is what we are, have, what we are going to launch in half year two, and this will definitely also accelerate our growth in the cloud. Now, we, we still have to see what does this means with regard to the revenue mix in our P&L, but you can also be very sure we will also double down on our efforts to really also managing our bottom line in an extreme tight way. We just did one of the biggest reorganizations in SAP, now finally gaining also the synergies on the bottom line. And this is why we will do both. And later on this year, when we also see how the market will de develop in light of COVID, we will also give you then an update on the midterm mid outlook. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. That's it. Let's move to the next question, please. Thank you. The next question comes from James Goodman of Barclays. Please go ahead. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let me come back to um, the Qualtrics announcement, please. Um, really just what's prompted the decision now, especially, I guess, since such a focus um, at Sapphire around around tighter integration. And, you know, I appreciate your comments that you'll remain um, very focused on the combined go-to-market and R&D. But, you know, is there any um, effect here in terms of, of product integration and particularly in, in the sort of HRM uh, area? And then also um, relating to Qualtrics, can you say anything around um, either the size of the minority stake you're, you're considering um, listing and, and what you plan to do with the proceeds? Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks for your question. Uh, let me go first, and then I will hand over to Wine, and Luca can talk about the listing later on. Um, yeah, so first, I guess in the last three months, uh, the person to which I talked the most is definitely Wine. You know, because when I took over the company as sole CEO, of course, a huge focus on was on how to also move Qualtrics to the next level. I mean, when you look back 19 months, you know, Qualtrics came into SAP, and since then, Qualtrics has beaten all of our expectations, all of the objectives we have set in the initial business case. And you see this also in our external segment. But Wine and I were actually, we are never satisfied with the current status quo. So we kicked around certain ideas and really with the, under, with the underlying condition to accelerate the growth of Qualtrics. And while we have seen big success with the help of their Salesforce to sell Qualtrics into our installed base, we also have seen that experience management is really a fast growth category out there in the market. So then, the idea of the IPO came up, and actually we figured out that this is a win-win situation 
And honestly, until today, I'm still figuring out what is actually the downside. But for me, there is no downside. As we will continue to further embed Qualtrics within our intelligent enterprise. Part of our product strategy, besides human experience management, we now figured out four other categories which we will launch in the next quarters to come and which we will also sell together. So there is no change because of the partial IPO. On top, we give Wine and the leadership team the flexibility to also go you know, out in the market for the non-SAP customer base, where there's also huge growth. And we, of course, also make sure that they have the capitalization to also go after that, that market and also grow the, the Qualtrics business outside uh, of the SAP customer base. And last but not least, coming back to SAP, another win is, of course, that it also gives us the fi financial power to also then go after our own growth initiatives, like I just mentioned, the industry cloud. And these were, in a nutshell, the main reasons. And, of course, you know, we also want to retain the great leadership team of Wine and his ex key executives. And with that, over to you, Wine. Yeah, so thanks, Christian, and uh, thanks for the question. It's a good one. Um, look, I mean, I started Qualtrics 20 years ago in my parents' basement. And, um, you know, from the day one that we got into SAP, they have done a phenomenal job. It's just treating this like a partnership. And, um, you know, it's been probably the most founder-friendly and entrepreneurial-friendly company that a founder could go integrate themselves into because of how it's been treated. So the way this came about was no different than how it's gone the whole time. Hey, Ryan, what do you see? What do we see? And how do we actually go do something together? And as Christian, when he got into the role, first thing he said was, hey, how can we really take advantage of this category? And we kicked around a bunch of different ideas. And by the way, if I if I take a step back, there's not one of the top five software companies in the world that hasn't thought about this or wanted to do this at some point with either one or multiple assets because they figured that, hey, we could go bigger with it. And we could go bigger because of focus and um, some of that some of the the benefits of being together, but also the benefits of going after the market. But they don't do it because either they don't have confidence that the business can perform as a standalone as well with the integrations, or when they pull out the integrated product, um, or at some point they spin out or uncouple a little bit, that it will destroy it. Or they don't have the founding team that actually built it, so it would be a distant cousin of what was there. And a lot of times they're not innovative enough to say, hey, we're going to go down that road. Well, none of those are true in this case. SAP's clearly innovative enough to do this. They're willing to have conviction and move. We get the benefit of being together, which is the true partnership that we have. If anything, we're going to double down on that, and we're starting to get some great, great momentum. And um, the team, they've done a phenomenal job of keeping the team here, which makes all of this possible and people are super fired up and ready to go. Now, there's another macro trend here, which is, you know, experience management and the category that we created is we've seen through COVID, there's not one CEO out there that's not trying to understand on not an annual basis, but a weekly basis what's going on and how the customers are feeling that they're serving. So we're allowing them to have a conversation at scale with their customer base and how their employees are doing, which has never been more important than right now. And so we're seeing just absolute um, commitment from every single leader for, that we talk to, both on the government side, the academic side, um, and the corporate side, all trying to understand the hearts and minds of their stakeholders. And that's where Qualtrics sits. And so integrating that into every single one of the the major SAP products from commerce to, to the success factors platform where they can have the ability to get a pulse at any moment. Um, this is what's also really driving this. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a long rant on the decision making process here, but like I said, Christian, Luca, um, and the team have been nothing but innovative in this process. So you have to give them a lot of props. 
Uh, thanks a lot. So let me then uh, complete the answer just with uh, those three aspects that you've asked for a more, from a more technical perspective. And indeed, I mean, they are probably one of the most uh, asked questions that I've received since, since this morning. In terms of the IPO sizing, we frankly don't know it uh, exactly yet. I mean, if you look at uh, benchmark uh, U.S. tech IPOs, typically they float at a rate of somewhere between 10, 15, perhaps a notch above that, and we will not be miles away from that uh, kind of uh, uh, um, broad size range. Uh, so it's clear that also after the IPO, SAP will have the clear majority um, of the shareholding. In terms of um, the use of proceeds, we follow two uh, primary objectives here. First of all, we want to make sure that Qualtrics is properly capitalized so that they can pursue um, their investment um, plans uh, and uh, can, uh, you know, properly seize the opportunities that exist out uh, in the market. Uh, but clearly, um, we also expect uh, that there will be um, proceeds uh, after having satisfied this uh, um, purpose uh, that will go to SAP. And uh, on those proceeds, uh, we will clearly use them in order to um, foster our own strategic growth priorities, whether they be organic or also perhaps selective um, um, tuck in m &A, uh, activities. And in terms of the timing of a listing, um, that is really something uh, which uh, we cannot, uh, um, you know, comment on at this point in time. Clearly, we need to prepare um, all of the documentation in the U.S. As you know, um, this is a quite sophisticated process to go through. Um, the good news is that we actually have a pretty good basis to, uh, um, to work from because Qualtrics had been going uh, very far there already, but it still will take us a couple months before we are ready. And then it's really going to be a question of the market conditions that are prevailing um, at that point in time. Um, but uh, you will, of course, uh, as the rest of the market, then receive updates uh, when we are ready to file. That's great. Well, thank yeah, you. Thanks for the detail and all the best for the IPA. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take the next question, please. Thank you. The next question comes from Mark Marler from Bernstein Research. Please go ahead. Absolutely. Um, Luca, cash flow was real strong this quarter. In the press release, you, draw, you discussed the main drivers of lower payments to suppliers and tax rates. Tax rates. Can you give us some more clarification on lower payments to suppliers? Is this just the T&E? Is there the reorganization? How sustainable do you see that? And then quickly for Christian, can you give us some more color on the mix of all the SAP customers you added this quarter? Um, I think it surprised people that you added so many. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'll start with the cash flow question. So behind lower supplier payments is really the combined uh, um, efforts that we have taken uh, to uh, trim down on uh, discretionary expenses, uh, but also some of the natural savings um, that uh, we have seen in the first half year. And so it's, uh, of course, things like uh, the T&E spend, which has been dramatically down in Q2, as you might uh, guess. Uh, but it's also facility-related uh, spendings during the office lockdowns um, that we have seen. Um, it's uh, additional discretionary um, spending um, on things like, uh, you know, um, IT hardware and so on and so forth. Um, you have seen as well that our CapEx, uh, even against the very uh, low level that we had reached already last year, is further down. So we are really uh, double-clicking and challenging uh, any of those expenditures for whether they are truly necessary. Uh, and that basically shows uh, in this aspect. But uh, also to be clear, uh, the main effect of the significantly improved cash flow is uh, mainly um, lower restructuring-related um, cash payouts um, as well as substantially lower um, tax payments uh, because uh, last year we still had a, a huge amount of uh, significant one-time uh, effects there. Um, and this year we are not seeing any. As I shared during my prepared remarks, we're actually getting cash back uh, uh, from a tax perspective uh, very likely later this year. Um, so um, that's actually not a headwind anymore, but a tailwind um, to our cash flow progress. Yeah, and on the mix of the customers we onboarded this quarter, I will hand this over to Adair. Maybe just one quick comment. I mean, I, of course, was personally very happy to see also again the huge net new customer share for s hana Cloud as this clearly demonstrates that we are not only moving our installed base customers to the cloud, but that we are also winning out there net new, which also proves the value of the solution. And I'm actually also very excited about the November release coming for S4HANA Public Cloud, as there will be, again, 
you know, major improvements in there, like a new business configuration, opening up, you know, more features and functions for our customers, the integration, then done by 90%, you know, enabling us to cross-sell our LOB cloud applications in a much better way. But for now, over to Adair to give you more details about the customer mix. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Mark. Thank you, Christian. Um, net new name acquisition is actually a very important focus for us in the execution of every single quarter. And it was uh, very refreshing in, in this particular quarter to see net new names added right across our customer segment base. So in some cases, that would be a competitive win back, uh, particularly in the enterprise space. Um, and in the general business space, this was the transition of companies to enterprise-grade software as their business is growing. I also think a very important element of our success in net new names, aside from the focus that we put on it directly with our own sales team, is the role of our partner eco ecosystem, particularly in the general business space, where more than 80% of the net new names that are delivered to SAP in this space are delivered by our very vibrant and very active uh, partner ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Let's take the next thank question, you. please. Thank you. The next question comes from Stefan Slavinsky from Exxon BNP. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, maybe just, Luke, a question for you on, on the Qualtrics uh, potential IPO and, and the impact on cash flows. I appreciate there's going to be a lot of moving parts, and we'll get a full update later this year. but. On the one hand, as an independent company, it sounds like Qualtrics is going to go for growth, and maybe we won't see the cash flow improvements there between now and the midterm that maybe we would have hoped. But on the other hand, I guess um, uh, the stock-based compensation will be coming down as, as they move to a more traditional U.S.-style um, stock option plan. Can you give us any indication as to the, the stock-based comp at SAP and, and what percent maybe is, is kind of Qualtrics-driven? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you are um, you are right on this assumption. Uh, I would argue that actually Qualtrics has even been before we acquired them actually uh, quite I wouldn't call it frugal, but quite uh, successful uh, in uh, managing to um, a positive cash flow um, situation. Um, so the business has all of the ingredients um, to even in a high growth scenario uh, um, be um, uh, be a positive cash flow grower. That's uh, primarily because of it's very high efficiency uh, in terms of cloud gross margins, so the business scales uh, um, very effectively. Um, so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't bet against them being able to uh, be quite pleasing on, in terms of uh, cash flow um, performance also after an IPO. When it comes to the share-based compensation, you're right at SAP. Obviously, um, share-based compensation is cash settled um, after an IPO. Uh, um, the um, um, thesis that uh, this U.S. listed company will um, employ um, um, U.S. equity-based uh, um, stock compensation is obviously um, accurate, um, so this will be um, um, some relief uh, on the cash flow side. Um, at the moment, um, we um, have a couple hundred million um, um, USD of, uh, um, um, of uh, options or RSUs uh, on the SAP side outstanding for management and uh, employees from um, uh, Qualtrics, and obviously um, that over time would then go away um, after an IPO. So um, on that side, you're very accurate. Great. Thanks okay. for the detail. And if I, if I could just squeeze in one, one other one for Adair, just wondering if you've seen anything uh, in July that had changed from what you saw in Q2, any shifts, anything's opening up, closing back down um, that would give us a window on what's going on today. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I don't really think that we saw much of a significant difference between July and some of the activities uh, that we saw throughout Q2 because I think Q2 has the whole gamut of various different geographies navigating uh, the COVID situation from, you know, first lockdowns in some parts of the world to the reoccurrence in others and then, you know, the closing of cities or jurisdictions as a result of that. So nothing in July that um, initially gave us any additional uh, cause for concern or, or movements that differentiated very significantly in any way from, from what we experienced during the course of Q2. Okay, thank you. 
Let's take the next question, please. Thank you. The next question comes from John King of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the questions and congratulations on, on the quarter. Um, I just want to follow up on, on one, of the, one of the weaker areas in the quarter. You know, Concur, obviously a big slowdown there. You know, against the rest of the cloud assets seemed pretty robust. So I'm just wondering, you know, I think – I got the sense that actually transactional wasn't such a, a big a big part of Concur. So um, was that all the transactional business slowing down, or was there any uh, kind of pausing of subscriptions anywhere there, just given the soft environment, I suppose, that we see for travel? Um, so that would be the, the first one. Um, and then maybe, I'm not sure if this is for Luca or, or Christian, but on the second um, point was around CapEx. Um, could you just – I appreciate you've already given us uh, a big insight into your thinking um, around uh, you know, the analyst day coming up, and I know it's not all finalized, but on the um, CapEx itself, uh, I think you, you mentioned that you will continue to partner with hyperscalers. So does that suggest that CapEx should continue to be constrained? Thank you. Yeah, let me let me uh, take a first uh, crack at both questions. So first of all, on the CapEx side, um, you have seen we had already at our capital markets day uh, last year um, guided uh, to a, um, a pretty much flat uh, capex uh, year over year. We saw perhaps the potential for a slight increase in line with the growth of the business, um, but uh, um, this year actually we believe uh, that uh, we will not see an increase over last year. Um, given the results in the first half year, I think there is scope to even uh, have a lower capex spend in 2020 um, than in 20. 19. And I would uh, expect that also over the course of the next couple of years, uh, CAPEX will actually remain pretty flat uh, with uh, the main contributing factor being obviously the partnerships uh, with the hyperscalers. But beyond that, there are also other sources of CAPEX, uh, like facility CAPEX, for example, and there with some of the new trends on the future of work that we are seeing now um, emanating uh, from COVID, more hybrid work models. Uh, I think uh, the um, needs for expanded CAPEX expand also in this area will be probably more restricted than we, what we might have planned um, perhaps one or two years ago. Um, a second point on the transactional revenues. Um, you're right, of course, Concur has been most hard hit. And, uh, don't underestimate the transactional um, element of their revenues. Um, they um, actually have, uh, on a per annum basis, um, um, something um, like um, a couple hundred million, so they are the second largest uh, um, source of transactional um, revenues uh, after Ariba, uh, and uh, that basically has almost disappeared. Um, so um, usually um, they would have uh, you know, a couple hundred, uh, um, 200 to 300 million. Um, they posted a low double-digit million uh, figure of transactional values in Q2, and that, of course, has, a, has an impact. So these revenues were down more than 80%. Um, but it's not the only reason we disclose as well um, in um, – uh, in our um, quarterly reporting, um, the contribution from the intelligent spend uh, assets in totality, and there you can also see that their revenue also uh, outside of Concur has been coming down um, to a single-digit uh, um, number, uh, where usually those assets would all grow somewhere in the mid-teens. Um, and so also in Ariba, uh, transactional revenues uh, were um, slowing down, albeit not nearly at the same pace uh, as Concur. And now, of course, the big question is uh, um, what will happen uh, in the second half year. As you know, um, we assume a gradually improving uh, demand environment in the second half year. That holds for software licenses, but obviously holds uh, for our new cloud order entry as well as transactional revenues uh, as well. And uh, that jury is obviously still out there um, with some of the uh, relaxed restrictions here in Europe and other parts of the world. Um, there is certainly um, some uh, light at the end of the tunnel here, um, but uh, clearly in Q2, uh, the perfect storm uh, was uh, hitting us and concur. Um, but you rightfully say as well that the rest of the business, our contractually committed business, uh, is very uh, resilient. You have seen that our SaaS pass uh, uh, assets have been up in the high 20s, um, and uh, also our infrastructure as a service business is still growing somewhere in the mid-20s. Um, so um, our business fundamentally is healthy, and uh, the transactional revenues uh, undoubtedly will come back uh, as uh, you know the restrictions ease and as we see the tail end of the crisis. And uh, John, as usual, our our CFO already answered that question in a very professional manner. 
just to maybe one comment from my side, as there's a lot of talk about the hyperscalers and the partnerships we are having. And let me be very clear. I mean, we, of course, stay very committed yeah, to those partnerships, as we don't want to play in the cloud infrastructure market. But what is also very important for me is that our customers also understand that the business transformation is not only happening, happening by moving workloads to a cloud infrastructure. This is only happening if you are transforming business processes, if you are adapting to new business models. And this is why, together with the Zayn team, we are working also on an offering to make sure that our customers really get, you know, both on the one hand side a move to the cloud, but also with our SI partners a transformation of their business. And this is something what we are working on to really bring the partnership to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. We move to the next question, please. Thank you. Next question comes from Adam Wood of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you very much for taking my question as well. Uh, I've also got two, please. Uh, maybe just first of all, uh, probably for Christian, on the integration side, you've spoken about this quite a lot now. Would it be possible to get a little bit of feedback from what the customer response has been um, and how much you think that could uh, accelerate and drive the migration to S4HANA more quickly than would have been the case otherwise? And then maybe just secondly, you've talked about SAP doubling down in areas that you have the right to win. Could you talk a little bit in, in terms of where we are on the re reallocation of resources from areas you're deprioritizing to areas you're focusing on? Um, and, and if you could give any examples of, of how that's benefited you, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, two points on that. So first, uh, Adam, when we talk about s and the integration, you know, uh, by the end of the year, 90% of that will be done. And also, as I said in the past, this will not only be a technical integration. I mean, we are also harmonizing our data domain model as the semantics of the data have to fit together when you talk about seamless business processes, when you talk about the 360 steering of the business. And that, again, can only be done as a, by SAP. And when we then put our data domain model on our platform, by the way, the platform also becomes more attractive for our ecosystem uh, to build new applications as it's now much more easier to expand and extend our core applications. And with that, of course, also comes a much better cross sell potential. And in our install base, I mean, our ERP customers are used that an HR solution talks to a finance solution, that a procurement solution talks to, again, also to a finance solution for procure to pay. And this is what we are now building. And with that, of course, we see an acceleration both for S4 HANA Cloud, but also, of course, for our core LOB applications, as there's still a huge potential also to do cross sell into our existing ERP customers. And then last but not least, when we are talking about the new quotes initiatives, I mean, the industry cloud is for me just a natural expansion of our core application portfolio. As I mentioned before, when you talk about industry 4.0 and digitizing a factory, again, for predictive maintenance, you need data from ERP, from the supply chain. And this is what we are now delivering. And there, it's all about focus. You heard, you know, our news with Siemens. We are not giving up there, you know, a huge existing market of SAP. It's not like that we uh, invested a lot of dollars in the last years on, in PLM. Now we are giving actually our customers a clear roadmap. We will, of course, bundle now in a seamless way our supply chain, our ERP solution with Siemens uh, to really make the integration work from the factory into the ERP. Actually, I expect that we can accelerate the sales of our supply chain in ERP solutions with that. And there are other parts of the uh, portfolio where we, of course, double down on. We had an absolute blowout water on commerce, so we definitely double down on also, again, there, integrating commerce to the supply chain, integrating commerce to the flexible license models you can run in S4, and with that, of course, we want to boost that. And in the product strategy you know, work we did in the last three months, we clearly emphasized that, and there will be more news to come where you see that SAP will also increase the focus uh, also for each of the industries, as we will also not serve all the 25 industries, we will also use their partner solutions to expand our portfolio. Maybe, can I um, perhaps add to that? Uh, maybe just add a little bit of color to that, um, Adam. Um, uh, when you look at our customer base and their expectation around migration to S4, integration is absolutely one of those expectations. Um, and we can see a very clear roadmap across four clear end-to-end -end business processes that will be complete by the end of this year. 
Um, this has an incredible impact on the business case that underpins the migration to S4. And the business case has a series of costs in it. If, of course, the cost of integration is removed from that business case, then the total cost of ownership is much lower for the customer. And aside from the value that S4 itself delivers as a business transformation uh, piece of software, the cost of ownership becomes um, much more attractive and much more tangible for our customers. And then I would just like to add, in addition to the, you know, the double down, which um, Christian has mentioned in many of our product and engineering teams, that is a end-to-end -end double down. So where there is a focus, for instance, on a particular solution, a particular industry, a particular investment, that focus includes the go-to-market engine of SAP to ensure that there is alignment between what our colleagues in product engineering are designing and delivering and the capabilities of the go-to-market team to uh, clearly articulate the value propositions of those solutions to our customers. Okay, thank you. Let's take the next question, please. We take our next question from Phil Winslow of Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Question and uh, congrats on a great quarter. And uh, all tricks. Uh, two questions. First, for you're breaking up the conversations with Cus. Here, let me see. Maybe we, uh, the we can't hear you. The line is um, to see you're breaking up. If you operator, can you take the next question, please? And then we switch to Phil Winslow later on. Certainly. The next question comes from Kirk Matern from Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'll echo the congrats on the quarter. Actually, my question is for Ryan. If uh, I'll, I'll pull him back in as he's going to have to get used to answering analyst questions more often now. Um, but, uh, Ryan, I was just wondering, could you just give us an example of, you know, how you think the separation is going to help you accelerate the business, meaning, and Christian, please add, add, add on as well. But, you know, were there partners that you thought you could do more with that maybe were a little bit you know, nervous about the ownership structure, or is it just the ability for you to hire salespeople at a more rapid pace? I was just kind of curious. You know, obviously this is all about sort of expanding, you know, or, or accelerating Qualtrics growth and expanding the category. Can you just give us a couple examples of your conversations, you know, why you think this is the right way to go? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So I think first, um, when we created this category in 2017, you know, and I remember going on our first road show. I don't know how many people can say that, but we're going to be able to say that. Go on our first road show. You know, I think the market was going, hey, what's this experience management? It makes sense. It's intriguing. We just see that there's so much more that we can do to help create that category. That's going to be a lot easier to do with one microphone and one voice. And um, SAP has been the ultimate amplifier and has the global reach that is unprecedented. And I think that um, we continue to get that. From a strategic standpoint on two fronts, we see massive opportunity. Number one is, look, there are a bunch of other uh, strategic providers that I think that we could go partner with. It's not that they weren't willing to partner, but, um, you know, we want to do big things with them, and I think this this will help. And I think we'll try to pattern a little bit after what we're doing with SAP where, you know, experience management is a core part of all products and platform. And you start thinking about, hey, every single app on the Internet should have a Qualtrics component built in to be able to have a conversation with the end user, right? You think about every product, either back office or front office, could have that same integration you start to see how important um, the Qualtrics platform is. But but probably most importantly, there's a lot of technology that we like out there. So I think this gives us an opportunity to go make our own acquisitions and be able to truly expand our vision for what experience management can be and, and really continue to paint what we saw years ago. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years, solving the same problem, and we've have, we have this, this vision of where this can go. And, to have SAP behind us and then be able to go run and go get, you know, the best talent in the world um, to go do this and, and get people on board. It's, as Christian said, we just can't see any downsides to this. And, um, you know, I think that as we've slept on this for, 
quite a few weeks now, we're saying, hey, we still feel more excited than we did when we first came up with it. So that's that's a pretty good sign. That's great. Thanks, Ryan. And just for my side, yeah, and just for my side, I mean, talking about the SDP side of the house, I mean, you know, look, I mean, even in the new, you know, model going then forward, once we, you know, went IPO, for SAP and Qualtrics, it will be even more important than to build out continuous revenue streams. And uh, we did a lot of work in the last three months on the product strategy side. At there and team, together with Qualtrics, built out a sales engagement model, which really perfectly, you know, works. Today, we won some very large transformational deals in Q2 with the help of the SAP uh, sales force, and that will just continue in the future. Okay, thank you. The next question, please. Thank you. The next question comes from Phil Winslow from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi there. I think my IP phone. Mm-hmm. And uh, congratulations on a, a great quarter. And maybe a, a Derek can so, chime in too. As yeah. It changes so customer conversations in terms of. Sorry, is this so, better? The line breaks up again. So. Um, no. We probably give you a question on the next earnings call. I think, operator, we need to switch to uh, the next question, please. Thank Sorry you. For the next question comes from Julian Serafini from Jefferies. Please go ahead. About a three hundred million safety cushion go ahead. baked into this just free cash flow guidance. Um, Luca, in terms of the free cash flow guidance for 2020, you had talked about a 300 million euro um, safety cushion being baked into the guidance. Is that still included in your guidance today, or has that been removed? And then second of all, just in terms of new business, are you able to provide any color just in terms of the new cloud bookings, in terms of how that has performed in the quarter? I know you don't disclose the metric anymore. Yeah, uh, so on the second one, that is really that is really the answer. Um, we have replaced it by the current cloud backlog, and you have seen that uh, those numbers were very healthy, um, and uh, we've given some individual color um, commentary, so um, very well uh, developing uh, solutions in the quarter where commerce, uh, where digital supply chain management uh, was obviously Qualtrics. Uh, um, and uh, so from that perspective, um, that's about all that we can do here. But in terms of the free cash flow, um, um, guidance. Uh, so um, we have basically increased it um, by 500 million. Um, there um, may still be scope, to be quite honest, to do more, but that depends very much uh, also on how the um, payment behavior of customers will develop in the second half year. I must say that in the first half year, we have seen a pretty good um, 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 uh, development in this respect, so our initial concerns that we had uh, uh, as we entered the crisis um, were not coming through, um, but uh, um, still, of course, uh, we want to, you know, cater to this risk uh, and therefore uh, have still um, left ourselves uh, a bit of a cushion, in particular given that uh, our CAPEX assumptions for the second half here are probably um, still quite conservative. So if everything goes well and we don't see a major deterioration on the customer Customer front in H2, I think there is scope to do a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one final question. Thank you. The final question comes from Mohamed Moala from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, a quick one. I mean, your unchanged guidance for 2020 essentially uh, assumes no meaningful acceleration in the second half. Now, I know you had said that you anticipated the environment to sort of progressively improve. So is it just you being conservative and maybe can you give us a sense, aside from the strength you saw in Asia, how the other geographies are sort of coming back, particularly North America and uh, the uh, uh, European uh, market and, and sort of how the pipeline is and, and, and how you kind of expect second half seasonality to develop. Thank you. Yeah, so on the on the regional color, I will hand over to um, Adair in a second, but uh, on the guidance, uh, um, let's be real here. Um, I think we are very uh, confident now based on how we have ended the first half year, but this is not yet the time to frolic or um, break any champagne corbels or anything like that. Uh, let's not forget, uh, while 
the um, guidance assumes a continued uh, um, you know, uh, improvement of uh, the demand environment. We cannot take this for granted necessarily. There is still substantial uncertainty in the system. Um, what about the uh, development of infection rates? Is there a risk of a second lockdown? I think nobody can rule this out at this present time, even though everybody is hoping, of course, uh, that it will not occur. And let's also not forget that the seasonality for software licenses is becoming uh, much larger in the second half year with the Q4 in particular that has a much uh, higher weight on software licenses. Uh, and uh, given that uh, uncertainty, I think it is uh, absolutely understandable um, that uh, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Uh, we are glad um, that we did well in Q2, better than we expected ourselves, um, but that is not a guarantee um, for success in the second half year. Uh, we need to have our value story right for the customers. We need to um, you know, um, rely on uh, our collective effort to achieve customer success across all functions uh, of the company, and then uh, we are able to demonstrate the transformational value that our solutions can bring uh, to our customers, and even in difficult times, uh, rightfully um, ask for an order. But in that sequence, and we need to first prove that out. Um, perhaps, Mahalaj, I'll just maybe add a little bit of regional color and then just uh, a little bit of the, the sentiment of the team looking forward into the second half to conclude. Um, as you saw from our Q2 results, we had a very strong showing in Asia, um, and um, this was certainly related to the emergence of certain geographies um, from the lockdown environment. Um, but of course, we also saw a resurgence in China, and specifically in Beijing, uh, right at the tail end of our quarter, in fact. And you know, for us, 45% of our sales force are located in that particular office in that jurisdiction. So these are the unknowns that we are going to have to navigate as we go into the second half. Um, the team have uh, taken, as Luca has already indicated, a value-based and a customer-orientated and empathetic approach towards the business in the second half. We have come out of a large Digital Sapphire, the first time that we ran a digital event. Um, whilst um, there are different nuances about an event of that scale at a digital level, one of the benefits for us was our ability to deliver that event in five languages in the time zones of our customers across the world. And so we were able to reach a much broader audience. We're also really focusing very much in the second half, as we did in Q2, on the ability to control the controllable. So those things that are within our control, the execution of our engagement with our customers, our creativity in engaging with our customers, and the value propositions that we present. And I think as long as the team executes well, controlling the controllable, that's pretty much all that we can ask for them going into the second half. Very good. Great. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Well, this concludes the second quarter 2020 SAP earnings call. Thanks so much for joining, and you can now disconnect. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Take care.